All right, take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 85. Uh, I've been wrestling with this all afternoon. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I have three messages coming out of this text. I'm only going to do one of them tonight. And I thought, well, no, I'll just we'll look at the verse. We'll read the verse, and then we'll go to a, another passage in Psalm 37. And I thought, no, I don't think I want to do that either. So let's look at this wonderful text. Let me read the first six verses, uh, first eight verses, rather, of Psalm 85. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the, notice this next phrase, the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou, not re, uh, wilt thou be angry with us forever? Uh, I'm sorry, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Now, there are several things I want to point out to you, first of all, in these verses. Uh, when I read my Bible, I like to look for phrases that are repeated. You will notice a phrase, thou hast, occurs six times in the first three verses, twice in each verse. And there the psalmist is reflecting upon what God had already done for his people in the past. In verse 4, he turns to the present need of the hour with these expressions in verse 4, turn us. In verse 6, revive us. In verse 7, show us. And also in verse 7, grant us. It's also interesting to note, or as Jimmy Stewart says, it's interesting to note that there are five references to God's anger and God's wrath in these verses. In fact, I pointed out the one to you in verse 3 where he speaks of the fierceness of thine anger. Now, there are multitudes of people today who believe God is simply a God of love, and they even question that. Well, if God's a God of love, why do we have all the trouble we're having in the world today? You're blaming God for that? First of all, if you say there's a God of love, if, there's, if God's a God of love, you're assuming that there is love, Where's the source of that love? It can only come from God. And so don't blame God for all the problems. Blame Adam and Eve and, and blame, don't, don't blame the, the police officers for what's happened. I mean, the guy should be, should be prosecuted and he is being charged. But folks, listen, they're just using this as an excuse to be savages. It's just an excuse. They're not protesting. They're looting. They're, they're thieves. They're thugs. They're robbers. And the Bible speaks here about the fierceness of God's anger. Folks, listen, God hates sin. Right. Let me tell you something. God not only hates the sin of these, of these uh, rioters and these uh, would-be murderers and these thugs. God hates sin and the lives of his people. Yeah. It doesn't matter saved or unsaved. God hates sin and God will judge sin. People may get away with an awful lot here, but they'll not get away with anything when they stand before the God of heaven. And so he speaks about the fierceness of his anger. And then in verse 4, um, he turns to the present need of the hour, hour turn us, O God, uh, and revive us and show us and grant us thy salvation. Also in verses 5 and 6, there are three phrases that begin with this word, or questions begin with these words, wilt thou. It is very significant they are not statements, thou wilt, but it's a, it's a question of pleading, wilt thou? Verse 5, the psalmist says, Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Have we come so far down? Have we backslidden so far? Have we gotten so far away from the word of God and the will of God that there's no hope that we're ever going to have another revival? In verse 6, he says, Wilt thou not revive us again? Again, there is the sense in which the psalmist here is pleading with God, God, you did it before, won't you do it again? America has had her share of revivals, but the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening and the, and the local revivals under the preaching of men like Bob Jones Sr. and Sam Jones and the two Gypsy Smiths and, and Billy Sunday, when Billy Sunday went to town, 
uh, the, the false churches were not strengthened. Jails were empty. Brothels were being closed. Crime was down. Why? Because people were getting converted after four to six weeks of, of strong evangelistic Bible preaching. Folks, listen. God says, uh, the psalmist says, Wilt thou not do it once more? Pastor was talking about Josiah. Josiah was the one fellow who did what was right, and God said, because you've done what's right, I'm going to hold my judgment back one more generation. Now, folks, listen to me. God will judge America. God has to judge America. You can't slaughter 67 million of our people. We talk about Hitler. We talk about Mao Zedong. We talk about Stalin. Planned Parenthood is no better. Folks, listen, it's not abortion. It is the slaughterhouse of young children and, 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 and babies. They, they're all concerned about the COVID-19. Big deal. More people will die of the flu than will die of the COVID. If they want to save lives, they need to shut down Planned Parenthood. Thousands of lives have died every day that this thing goes on. And our government and, and, and the liberals still want to give them money to pay for that. And so the psalmist here is saying, wilt thou not revive us again? I want you to notice four things here. The word revive, first of all, means to set going or to activate at a key word again. And the implication is that whatever is in need of revival at one time was active, it was going, but for whatever reason it has ceased to be active and needs to be restarted, revived. Now, um, Back in 19, let's see, 1907, in 1928 on December the 19th, uh, I don't remember that day because I wasn't born yet, <laughs> but my dad received a typical 21st birthday present for that generation. It was a gold pocket watch. That was pretty much standard fare when you turned 21. Guys, girls didn't get them, the guys did. And when my father died, my mother offered it to my brother. He didn't want it. He's not sentimental like I am. And so she offered it to me, and I thought, yeah, man, I'll take it. And I don't wear vests anymore. They're too hot and too uncomfortable. And, and most trousers don't have, uh, have uh, pocket or, or watch, uh, watch pockets. There, I get it out right anymore. So I just bought a gold, what I thought was a gold chain. <laughs> it didn't last long. It must have been made in China. And uh, put it in my pocket, you know. And I, I would take it out, not, not to see what time it was, but just to demonstrate my masculinity. I'm a man. I've arrived. I've got my walk in my pocket. Let me try that one again. I've got my pocket watch. You know what happened? Invariably, I would take it out and it would be stopped. 1921, they didn't have battery operated pocket watches. They were all wind up. So I would stop whatever I was doing and I'd wind and I would have a revival meeting with that watch. And I put it back in my pocket and guess what? Two hours later, it stopped again. Pastor, please forgive me for what I'm going to say. But I... I got tired of having revival meetings with that watch. I finally, one jeweler said, probably just needs a good cleaning. Well, it sits under a glass dome on my dresser back in South Carolina. Uh, but listen, folks, aren't you glad that God doesn't tire of having revival with his people? Amen. Would you please notice, number one, the priority of revival. It is not a statement, thou wilt not do it, but it's a question, will you not do it? Now, the first meal of the day is called, let's have some of the kids here answer. Young man, what's the first meal of the day called? Yeah, you. What's your name? Justice. What's the first meal of the day? When you get up in the morning, what meal do you have? Dinner? Breakfast. What is breakfast? <laughs> it's a meal that you eat in the morning. Pigs is pigs. All right. Uh, Breakfast is a compound word, meaning we take up two smaller words and glue them together to make a big word. Break and fast. Now, the word fast does not have to do with speed, but it has to do with going for a period of time without eating, fasting. And so when you get up in the morning, uh, unless you're one of those guys that gets up in the middle of the night and gets a ham and cheese sandwich, uh, you, know, you have fasted all night long. You get up and you break the fast. All right, now... Uh, because your body needs to be nutritionally fired up. Now, I ask you folks, you don't eat breakfast on Monday morning and not eat breakfast again until the following Monday morning, do you? Usually, breakfast is followed by lunch at noontime with a snack around 10, dinner at 5, and a snack around 3, and another snack around 8 before you go to bed at night. Now, <laughs> I got your eating habits, all right? Now, 
<clears throat> if our bodies need to be nutritionally charged that often, which they probably don't, how much more does our soul and our spirit need to be recharged? Folks, not just Sunday mornings. One of the things I pray that will come out of this, this nonsense is that God's people will have a hungering to be together in fellowship. Listen, the local church is non-existent when it's not in fellowship. Uh, when you're home watching on a television, you can watch a service, but you're not in church. That's not church. Church is the meeting together, the fellowship, the called out ones meeting together. And I'm, ho I'm hoping and praying that God's people are going to have a, a new revival in the sense of having a hunger for the fellowship that they have missed for the last two and a half months or however long it's been. And let me tell you this, any Christian who's content to say, well, I don't need to go to church. I can stay home and watch it on TV. That's a mark of a carnal, worldly Christian, if saved at all. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just trying to lay the facts on the table. You know, the pastor is supposed to be the shepherd, and the evangelist is supposed to be the sheepdog. He's not a wolf. He doesn't devour the flock, but he's there to stir the flock and hopefully get him back near the pastor again where they're going to feel safe, right? <laughs> anyway, well, the fact is that Revival doesn't happen just once a year when you have the evangelists come in. Revival, folks, is, is an ongoing uh, experience of God's people every day. The priority of revival. The songwriter said, do you really want revival? Are you willing to obey? Are you willing to commit? Are you willing to give up some things that maybe God would have, have you put out of your life? We said, no, I'm, I'm comfortable with my life the way it is. Number two, notice please the power of revival. It is found in a pronoun, thou wilt thou not revive us again. Now, there is, let me say this, there are two senses of, of the use of the word revival. One can be sort of a state of being where a person is in a right relationship with God, walking with God. That doesn't mean there's not going to be sin or disappointments, but they, they settle those things and they're walking with the Lord. Uh, in, in a very wonderful, wonderful way, enjoying God, if you please. But there's another sense and use of the word where the word revive means this is, this is slowed down. We need to restart it. We need to get this thing fired up again. Folks, we need to get the church of Jesus Christ fired up again. Return to the first love. We've grown cold. We've grown indifferent. Maybe this persecution, this religious persecution that we thought would never come to America. It's here. And let me tell you, it's not going to go away. The government has found out all it takes to get control is to have a little bug that nobody can see that 98.9% .9 of people are going to recover from. It doesn't take much to get people scared. Folks, listen, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Mark my words. And so the power of revival is God himself. By that I mean you cannot revive yourself. Now you can read the Bible, but you can't, you can't take the Bible and do the work that needs to be done in your life. God has to do that through the Holy Spirit. You know, I, we'd have, uh, when we lived in Philadelphia, we were only about an hour and a half from the Atlantic Ocean. And they have these big boardwalks. You know, I, I've been to Hawaii and Waikiki. Waikiki is a it's a man-made beach. It's a small beach. We got nicer beaches in New Jersey than than that. In fact, New Jersey, frankly, the whole state is Pennsylvania's beach. If you're from New Jersey, you probably don't appreciate that. But the whole state's all sand and pine trees, tomatoes and peaches and all the other good garden vegetables. But you know, people go out there in the ocean and they every year there are drownings. Every year there are people, the lifeguards have to go into it. A lifeguard can go out there and drag a victim up on the beach, but the lifeguard's work is not done. He can't say, well, I got a, a lunch date with a girl. I hope you feel better, buddy. Left to himself, the victim would die. <clears throat> because the victim cannot do the revival that needs to be. It's an external force. And the external force in the spiritual revival is none other than the Spirit of God working in our hearts as we allow him to do so. Now, the fact that we can't produce revival ourselves, I hope that doesn't discourage you. We need to pray for revival. But also, in addition to praying for revival, we need to prepare our hearts to receive revival if and when God chooses to send it in that sense of the term. Number three, notice the people revived. There are two words here, wilt thou not revive us again? in order that thy people <clears throat> may rejoice in thee. 
Now, we have come in modern days to use the terms revival and evangelism simultaneously. That is unfortunate because they are not simultaneous terms. They do not refer to the same thing. They are two completely different ministries of the Spirit of God to two completely different groups of people. I, I was in a meeting down in North Carolina, Virginia area, <clears throat> right along the border, and they had a big, big banner down on the main highway, Revival ends this Friday. I thought, really? Well, number one, I didn't know we were having revival. And if we did, I sure don't want it to end just because I have to leave and go on to another meeting. I had another pastor, had big signs up, they're going to have their fall revival or spring revival, whatever it was. He said, oh, Brother Ken, he said, we want to really make this an evangelistic outreach, so I want you to preach evangelistic sermons. I'm thinking, why did you call it revival meetings? I uh, had a meeting that ended on a Wednesday. Another evangelist friend of mine was about 100 miles away, and his meeting went through Friday. So I went on Thursday. Barb and I went over to hear him, and, and he was doing a series on great revivals in the Bible. And uh, upon inquiry, I found that Nehemiah 8 was not included in that. How can you do revivals in the Bible and avoid Nehemiah 8? He was preaching that night on the great revival in Nineveh under the preaching of Jonah. Now, I didn't discuss this with him. I didn't want to split hairs over this. But, folks, honestly, what took place in Nineveh was not a revival. It was the result of a citywide evangelistic campaign being conducted by a preacher who was sour and out of sorts with God and out of, and out of God's will, frankly. He was not really in fellowship with God. He said, well, he went. Yeah, why did he go? I think the only reason Jonah went, because the second time in chapter 3, the Bible says, he came and said, get up, Jonah, get going. He still was hesitant. Being swallowed by a great fish and surviving three days inside the belly is not the most comfortable thing. Probably wonder, I wonder what God will do if I don't go now. He had no heart for those people. As far as he was concerned, they could die and go to hell. They didn't deserve any better. Let me ask you, did he deserve any better? Do you and I deserve any better than that? Listen, friend, the worst, the worst criminal in the worst person, the worst sinner in the world is no worse off than you and I are without Christ. And you and I without Christ are no better than the worst sinner in the world without Christ. And so um, what happened in Nineveh was an evangelistic campaign. And of course, you know how he went and preached that he didn't want to see people get saved, and, and they did, and then he went up on the hillside. He wanted to get out of the way when God's judgment fell. But God repented, and God, God changed his mind in that sense, and people got saved, repented from the king all the way down to the paupers and the beggars. And, and so he sits up there waiting for the judgment to fall, and got hot, God sent a gourd, then the gourd right up, and he got mad at God, got mad at the gourd, and God says, have you got a right to be angry over a city with 120,000 babes in arms, probably a million, million and a half people that are lost, they're gonna die and go to hell? Have you no compassion for that? You have more concern over a stupid plan than the eternal souls of men and women and boys and girls. Listen, folks, there are a lot of professing Christians just like that today in our churches. Revival, my friend, begins at the house of God. <clears throat> Wilt thou not revive us again? I guess the greatest revival recorded in the Bible, in my opinion anyway, one of the greatest, is Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, you understand that collectively in the Old Testament, Israel is a type or picture of the individual believer of the New Testament. Please understand, the church today does not replace Israel. Those who believe that are heretics. Uh, Israel is in the plan of God. But the, but the nation, collectively, God's chosen people, are a picture of the individual believer of the New Testament, God's chosen people, the called out ones. So when God speaks to Israel, while we have to be careful about the interpretation, many times the principles apply to us today as much as it did when God gave them to Israel. And so we need to keep that in mind. Revival begins with the house of God. In Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra was not preaching to the uns unsaved, unregenerate Gentile nations. He was preaching to God's people. And by the way, if you read the first several verses, <clears throat> first <clears throat> six or seven verses of, of Nehemiah 8, you know what you'll find? They had a long service, number one probably five or six hours in length. They had a nursery service provided for the little ones. I believe that's clear in the text. Those that could hear with understanding were there from the dawn till about noonday, about five, six hour service. And number two, they stood while Ezra preached. And number three, Ezra expounded, he explained, 
he exposited the scriptures. It was not a condominium sermon, story after story. It was not a lot of illustrations. There's no record that there was any singing, no record that there was any offering. It was just five or six hours of Bible exposition. You know, folks, there is a crying need in the fundamental churches of America today for solid expository Bible preaching. We, our people need to know what the Bible teaches, not just evangelistic salvation sermons all the time. We can't feed our people uh, bread and, and, and water and milk and ice cream and, 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 and hamburgers and french fries. They need to get into the meat of the word, and that's the pastor's job to do that. And the great revival in Nehemiah was the result of the people not only hearing, but understanding what the word of God meant and how they were to live and how it applied to them. Number four, notice the purpose of revival. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people, here it is, may rejoice in thee. Folks, the purpose of revival is not to grow a big church. I, tell you, I am so sick and tired of this mega church syndrome today. A lot of these huge churches of, a, of thousands of people are going to go down in the annals of time as huge spiritual failures and shipwrecks. <clears throat> and then there are those little churches tucked away in, in the hollers of these remote areas. Uh, just a little congregation, but they've been faithful. Understand, God does not judge success on the basis of size, but on the basis of faithfulness to his word and to his will. Be faithful and let God add the numbers that he wants to add to it. And so the purpose of revival is so, is so that God's people <clears throat> may come to the place where they can literally, if I can put it this way, enjoy God. Where they can rejoice in him. Now, I think we're going to be done with this passage. So if you want to turn back now to Psalm 51, a few pages, I want to look at just a few other verses and then I'll be done. Psalm 51, please, and notice verse 12. David writes in this great psalm of penance and repentance and sorrow over the sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. And he says here in verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Restore unto me. David, the man after God's own heart, has gone now for nine months or better, living in sin, living in conspiracy, living in cover-up, thinking nobody knows about this but Joab and Bathsheba, and she's not going to tell, and he knows better than to tell. But chapter, chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, where that incident is recorded, you know, the last phrase in that chapter is, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David forgot all about the presence of God. David forgot all about, while he was carrying on, God was observing. God was watching. God was there. And the prophet of God came, Nathan, thou art the man. You've done it, You've done it uh, secretly. God's going to do it openly. You've given the, occasions, the, uh, the occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. And folks, God takes that very, very seriously. And so for almost a year, he had no joy. And finally, he comes to this place where he breaks down and says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I'll turn over to Philippians chapter 3, please. Philippians chapter 3. That's over in the New Testament, I believe. <laughs> chapter, I'm sorry, chapter, yeah, chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. And again I say rejoice. You know, when I was a kid, I used to go to the movies. In high school, I, the Lord convicted me about that. But we always went to the good films, like the old Yeller and, and uh, Ro Robinson Crusoe and, and the guy, that got, Davy Crockett and those good old films. And we went to see one that I finally got a copy of it and found out later it's, an, it's a pirated copy, I believe, called Song of the South. Do any of you remember that film, Song of the South? Do you remember that? Yeah. Uncle Remus yeah. and the tales of Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. 
considered politically incorrect today, which means it's a good film. And uh, in that song, uh, Uncle Remus, who's a, a slave on a southern plantation, but a guy who has just gobs and gobs of wisdom, and he sings a song called Zippity Doo Dah. Anybody remember that? Zippity Doo Dah, Zippity A. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine heading my way. Zippity Doo Dah, Zippity A. And he goes on to sing, Mr. Bluebird's on my shoulder, and everything's honky dory, everything's peaches and cream, not a care in the world. You know what the problem is in the Church of America today, folks? We have too many zippity doo dah Christians. They can only rejoice when everything's going their way, when there are no problems, no perplexities, no illnesses, no challenges in their life. Just all the skies are sunny and bright. Oh, they can rejoice then. But let a little trouble come in. Like, oh, all of a sudden, they're down in the mouth. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. Now one final reference, please, if you'll go back with me to the book of Habakkuk. Uh, do I get, need to give you 20 minutes to find it? <laughs> Depends on what Bible you have. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, in my Bible, it's page 927. That'll give you an idea. Huh? I've got a wide margin, Cambridge. Habakkuk ministers to a nation that is basically agricultural. And notice in verse 17 of chapter 3. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall, fall, shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Folks, listen. For an agricultural society, things could not be any worse than that. They're about to go under. Sound familiar today? But look at verse 18. <clears throat> the prophet of God says, yet in spite of that, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. My friend, listen, our joy does not depend upon circumstances. Our joy does not depend upon who wins or loses elections. Our joy does not depend upon how well the stock market does or doesn't do. Our joy is not based upon our health. People say, well, as long as you have your health, that's all that matters. What happens when you lose your health? Do you have to lose the joy of the Lord because you lose your health? I remember hearing Dr. Bill Fusco. Did you know him by any chance? Uh, and uh, he was president, I think, of Denver Baptist College seminary. His wife's name was Lorraine, and she was a concert-style pianist. I mean, she could play anything you put in front of her. And one day she came down with a terrible, terrible headache that would not go away. So finally, after trying all the over-the-counter things, she made a doctor's appointment. The doctor couldn't find anything out. He said, let's put you in the hospital, run a few tests, and see if we can figure this thing out. A few days later, the doctor confronted them with the bad news that she had a malignant brain tumor that was inoperable because of its location right at the base of the brain where the spinal column goes into the, or the, the cord goes into the spinal column. And there's nothing they could do. Little by little, she lost her feeling in her fingers, couldn't play the piano anymore. And eventually before she passed away, she was a paraplegic from the neck down. I heard her testimony when she was propped up in a wheelchair because she couldn't do anything. You know, I just had all these braces and stuff on her. She couldn't feed herself, couldn't do anything. And yet she gave her testimony. So you listen to that testimony, you think it's the voice of a, of a vibrant, healthy 35-year-old woman. The joy of the Lord just radiated in her voice. Well, she was in the hospital, and they, there's one particular nurse that was working with her. And one morning, the nurse came in, and Mrs. Fusco had been moved to another terminal um, wing, the uh, hospice wing. And this nurse went to her supervisor and she said, I have to be with Mrs. Fusco. Now, you know in the medical profession, they discourage you from getting too close to your patients for obvious reasons. But this nurse was, I mean, she said, I don't care if I have to work double shifts. I don't care if I have to work without pay. I have to be with Mrs. Fusco. And her supervisor said, why is it so important for you to be with this one patient? And you know what that unsaved nurse said? I don't know what Mrs. Fusco has, but I need it. 
And before the Lord took her home, she had the joy of leading that unsaved, religious but lost nurse to the Lord. Because there she is dying and still radiating the joy of the Lord. I had an illness. I had a violent reaction to an antibiotic, Keflex, back in 2001. And uh, it, it's, it, it, my, my skin was reproducing every 48 hours instead of every 48 days. I was covered with scale from head to I looked like a dinosaur. I couldn't play any of the instruments for 18 months. My hands would break out and bleed, and, and it was extremely painful. It was called pityriasis rubipolaris. It's the rarest form of psoriasis. And at the time, there were only, get this, there were only 28 cases known in the entire country. You can't get much more rare than that. It took me three and a half years to recover, and I thought my music was gone. And I had to come to a place when I would say, Lord, like Job, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. For whatever reason, the Lord has taken my music, and uh, I, you know, getting mad at God's not going to make me any happier. And I had to live with that for 18 months without any music. That's, that's a trial for a musician. But folks, God gave me a contentment, and then little by little, it began, it began to come back. The first time I played publicly, I was able to play the violin at my mother's funeral. Every dad goes here, how are your hands? How are your hands? And she was so concerned about my hands. I was wearing rubber gloves and, and heavy cream and stuff. In fact, one guy in our home church, big tall, about 6'5", you know, big baby. And uh, he came in one day, I wasn't wearing gloves, and he said, are you contagious? And I grabbed his hand and shook. I said, only when I touch you. <laughs> so anyway, listen, folks, get mad, getting mad at God doesn't accomplish anything. It robs you of the joy that God wants you to maintain in that circumstance. And who knows who's going to be influenced by what you go through and how you respond to it. Now, let me go back to my text again in Psalm 85. I, I told you not to go there, but I'm going to go back there. And I have one little, one little final request for you here. And that is to take the pronouns and make it personal. Your exercise is to take the plural and make it personal. So verse 6 would read this way, Wilt thou not revive me again, so that I might rejoice in thee? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time together in the word and music. Thank you for these wonderful testimonials that have been set to music and these hymns that we've been able to play and sing and enjoy. Lord, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord today. I pray that there will yet be an even greater hunger for the fellowship that has been so lacking for the past several months because of, of government controls. Lord, help us not to look to the government because they will fail us every time. Lord, help us to look to you. You are the mainstay. You are the one that worship is all about. And thank you for allowing us to be back together. Bless our time together and bless the words of the hearts of these who have listened. For Jesus' sake, amen. Pastor. I can't help but think of uh, the woman that the nurse that was with that uh, that woman, Mrs. Fusco. She said, "Whatever she has, I need that." You know, tomorrow morning when you get into your Bible and you start reading your Bible, God wants you to do this. He wants you to be looking for what you need. I need that. I've been writing, I've been reading, screw, excuse me, through the uh, epistles of Paul, and I have come across many things, and I've thought, that's what I need. We don't need to be reactionaries. That's right. We can react time and again to what's going on right now. What we need is the stability of an Apostle Paul, the love of an Apostle John, the passion for the gospel that so many in those times had. We need to listen to our God, a rejoice in what we can have in him. It's been good to be with you. It's been good to have all these here. And I hope and pray that you have a good day a good week. Be careful, be kind, be seeking after him, the author and finisher of our faith. Heavenly Father, go with us now. Truly, those of us who know you,
pray that it would be in our hearts. Revive us again, that we may rejoice in Thee. Help us to be seeking Thee out. If there's anyone here that does not know You as Savior, <clears throat> listening over the internet, that they would come to know Thee. I pray in Christ's name, amen.